So it is the hour. It is 1030 in Colorado. And for the Althea Center Denver community, this is when we gather every week. And we have the most extraordinary uh, talent, musicians, sorry. <laughs> I'm just feeling a little emotional today as, I, as I've come to realize, you know, uh, I'm kind of an introvert actually, so being at home with my family has been something I've really cherished. And, but watching the program last night, I, I realized just how many people are struggling with being uh, in, uh, in what feels like isolation to them and uh, away from friends, away from family, missing important family events. And, and so I'm touched because every week we have had the privilege of getting together uh, people reading, people performing music, people cooking, people helping serve. Uh, our community in Denver is a very, very special place and for now, we are meeting online. And if you've never been to the Althea Center in Denver, well, you're welcome to be with us virtually. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of, I can't see the texts from here, but you'll see there's a lot of love that's always flowing. And that's what we stay committed to. It's, it's, it's love, uh, community, connection in the spirit of oneness. Uh, there is no uh, practice, no religion that we adhere to over any other. Uh, whatever awakens us to the oneness of life, that is our message. So, if you want to learn more about Althea, you can go to altheacenter.org. If you want to learn about me, you can go to jonathanellerby.com. If you want to be involved in some of the upcoming Althea events and retreats and things like that, uh, you can visit the Althea webpage. Uh, follow the Facebook, sign up for the newsletter, all that stuff. Uh, we did a stay-at-home uh, sacred solitude retreat, something different than just being locked up at home, and it was really wonderful. We got great feedback. We had a small group last Thursday, so uh, I believe it'll be the 30th of April. We will do that again, and so we start the morning together in prayer and meditation. We end the day together in prayer and meditation. This time I'll probably do a, a class before it to help you get ready before the day of the retreat. So we do have some special things coming up as well as some special offerings coming from our community. So please stay tuned. Uh, we have amazing things that we can share online and virtually. Also, it's worth saying that we really, really appreciate the donations that have come in. Uh, there are donation links that are put up during our, our Facebook Live before, during, and after. And the reality is uh, we are not some uh, international organization that has a, a wellspring of funds. We are a community. And what our community gives is what we have. Uh, and whether that's talent or time, our volunteers or your donations, that is how the Althea Center stays open and running and providing this beautiful harbor of unity and compassion for the world. I think that's kind of what I needed to share in terms of uh, overviews and openings. Uh, Susan, our general manager, is going to be on duty. So if you have any urgent needs or questions that I can't see while I'm rambling on and on, you can post them. She's there to look after you. And if she needs to get me a message, I, I keep this iPad with me during the, um, the event. And, and so I can go to that in case of, in case of need. So with that, I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath. I'm going to get my uh, readings ready here. I'm going to invite you to let your eyes close. Let's settle in. Breathing in whatever way helps you um, to get centered. Letting your eyes close, sitting comfortably but alert. In through the nose and down into the belly. In through the nose and down into the belly. Long exhales. Feel yourself slowing down and settling down.
And we're going to take this just as a moment of quiet. Just a moment of quiet. Feel the way your awareness drops away from the busyness of the mind, the distractions of the heart, and find the stillness in yourself, the silence, where we all meet as one. When our eyes are closed and our hearts are open, Sometimes, in such a moment only, we see and feel and know the world as it truly is, united, all beings as one in spirit. When we close our eyes and embrace the precious breath, We find ourselves slowing down, settling down. And in that vastness, in that spaciousness, we cross the threshold of alone. We cross the threshold of private. We cross the threshold of inward. And we begin to sense the presence of all things within. All things within. In truth, though the heart aches and the mind is confused, the soul knows that we are not separated. We have not been disconnected, that those are illusions of the mind and these challenging times are, are inviting us to awaken our sleeping senses the way our ancestors once knew what it means to live by intuition, by energy, by the felt sense of interconnection. And as we move into our prayer, know that from this place, anyone and anything you wish to feel or receive your prayer, your blessing, your good wishes, your hope, they will receive it. For in this moment, whatever is felt in your heart will be felt in theirs, whether they know it or not. For prayer is not putting a letter in the mail and waiting for it to travel. Prayer is a vibration that is struck anywhere and felt everywhere. Prayer is a vibration that is struck anywhere and felt everywhere. In this way, together, each in our own way, we pray. To the one that is all, pure existence, Spirit, love, life, dear God. May the universe feel this prayer in every being, in every atom, in every subtle vibration.
together we pray for hope in hearts, clarity and peace in minds, and healing, quick, resilient healing for all those in need everywhere. We pray for caregivers everywhere, nurses, doctors, technicians, those who operate desks and computers and information systems, every single person that is a part of the healing journey for others. We pray for them, for their peace, for their health, for their protection, for all the caregivers love, wholeness, and well-being for your families and the people you care about. For those who are isolated by age, by vulnerability, pushed deeper into the isolation you live with daily, our love is with you. To the people who live with this uncertainty of health and future, economics and sustained wellness everywhere for whatever reason, we are with you. And you are in our hearts, for this planet, this beautiful home that we so often misunderstand and mistreat from the exploitation of her resources beyond what is balanced, mining the depths of our oceans harvesting the most beautiful and rare creatures, farming life like a factory. So many things we feel and know are in balance, and today we hold it in our hearts for healing. Today we pray for listening, listening to life and all its expressions, to the First Nations people, to the people of the Eastern Hemisphere, to the people of the Western Hemisphere, to children, to parents, to teachers, to leaders, to the land, to the water, to the sun and the creatures. Today, a prayer of listening, listening. May we feel and know our interconnection and the beautiful gift of wisdom and love that all things carry deep within. May it now be released. May we set down fear and division. May we embrace our wholeness and let our vulnerability unite us as we feel for each other and offer this prayer, this day, these words and all that we can, each in our own way, for anyone and everyone in need. For these things and all that we pray for with gratitude for the health that we do have, the safety that we do have, the security and finance that we do have. For all these things and more, we lift this prayer together and we are united as we say, Amen.
In this way, Althea comes together every week, and in this way, we affirm that even though things are rarely exactly the way we want them, we know, we trust that all things are occurring within the perfection of spirit, within the beautiful design of life. And just because our source, our substance, our spirit is whole and wise and loving doesn't mean we always remember it. It doesn't mean we always feel it, but it does mean it's always there if only we can remember how interconnected we are through it and how, if we slow down with open minds and hearts, we can know it. And so we read every week a statement of being that was passed from our founders in the late 1800s, a courageous and wise group of women, women healers, women mystics, women who knew that spirit and life are one. And so we read, and if you know this, if you remember, you can, you can say it out loud right now. God is all, both invisible and visible, one presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. And we, we are individualized expressions of God and are always one with this perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. So, here we are, doing this again, and again, and again, online, and, uh, and experiencing life in new ways. Of course, for many of us, there is distress, there's worry, there's fear. For many of us, there is sacrifice. And yet, and yet, we can both honor the pain of this time, and our unity in it. A lot of the world today is caught up in difference of opinion and the clinging, controlling, judging energy of the conditional mind, the conditional self, living from the thinnest sliver of our existence, of who and what we are. Last night, as I said to a few people before this began, my wife and I started to watch um, the One World concert, which was just an extraordinary testimony to, to love and compassion and kindness and the way that the community of the arts, more often than not because it is connected to heart and soul more than mind and pocketbook, can express what we truly feel and what we truly need. Some people don't think that a spiritual gathering is a time to talk about politics and money, but, but what we are finding out today is that we are all interconnected. The politics of one country is now the politics of every country. The resources of one country, the science of one country, the education of one country. When one is vulnerable in a destructive way, we are all vulnerable. When we create fear and animosity, then we don't share information freely. When we hear that any government, whether it's ours or another, is not collaborating or cooperating with another, no one is to blame because each creates the conditions of relationship for the other. And it is only in the energy of fear and competition that we find ourselves in a place where a leader, any leader in any country, would make a decision to protect theirs at the expense of others and in time we all suffer together. Last night as we watched this concert, 
or some of the concert, we were struck by just how willing, how willing so many millions of people are to be kind and caring for those suffering, for those caregiving, regardless of who's to blame for what, regardless of what is exaggerated or not, regardless of conspiracy theories, regardless of the differences between one country and another, one age and another, one gender or race and another, people united with the simple understanding that until it's resolved for everyone, we will not act selfishly, we will not act independently, we want us all to move on together, together on a planet where we look after each other, where we remember that we are family. And then I wake up this morning and the first news that I read is of people protesting, protesting having to stay in, protesting having to not work, protesting having to follow what they believe are fictitious and sometimes even uh, corruptly motivated guidelines to keep people home. We are not here today to judge the motives of our countries, the motives of our leaders, of our hospitals, of our healthcare specialists. We are gathered here because we believe in the oneness of life and creation and we understand that the fate of one at some level is the fate of all. The consciousness of one at some level shapes the experience of all. And this is more than an economic truth as we now feel it, more than a physical truth as we now feel it, more than a social or political truth as we now feel it. This we have been told since human beings could put word to record that this is a spiritual truth. All of our teachers, our great masters, our mystics, our guides, from the Buddha to Jesus, throughout all the mystical traditions and the mystical leaders of our spiritual traditions, they have all taught us that we are as one and that God is all. Only God is real. And when we live in this way, we remember what it means to be family. We remember what it means to be family. All living beings, more than brothers and sisters, our precious children. And how might the world be? How might our work be? How might our homes be? How might our relationships be if we treated each other as our most cherished family member, our most cherished child? In such a consciousness, all beings become family and the world becomes our body. The water as our blood. Air quality is our breath. No separation. We are only limited by our consciousness. I found this reading this morning while thinking about our message today. And I presume, although I don't really know, um, well, I'll just say the author is James Bertolino, a professor, uh, at the time he wrote this, he was a professor in creative writing at Willamette University in Oregon. And he wrote, we believe in the one message, like a fever chill, in each mushroom, inside the chanterelle, the morel, the rose coral and shaggy mane. We believe plankton travel the sea's veins. We believe 
the First Nations. We believe alpine snow water when it teases the crags and outcrops like clear crystal is memorizing sunlight to help the oysters grow. We believe in synchronicity. We believe when a poem is conceived, the beloved knows. God knows when we love. We believe Jupiter touches us with luck as we live and live again and that Jesus knew. We believe sod holds. We believe there are in each of us particles that once were stars, that matter is thought and thought is matter in energy as one and that this belief is the way of breathing in. In a week, we're going to celebrate Earth Day here in the Althea community. And uh, we will be with Sandra Wong and Joy Adams. They will actually, uh, through some Herculean efforts by our, our, our dear um, community manager, Susan, uh, we will all be together virtually. I am going to attempt to find a way to do this outside in nature. Uh, although when we work with others, and we share the screen. Typically, I have to be on a desktop, but who knows, maybe my desktop will travel outside next Sunday. And Sandra and Joy will be um, in Pine Top, a, a, a safe 10 feet from each other, and we will all be performing together for you. Today, we prepare for that Sunday. We prepare for that message. We prepare for this week where so many environmental organizations will be calling our attention towards Earth Day. Towards Earth Day and our relationship to the planet. And though we are facing a pandemic which seems to be a matter of, of health and social distance, quickly becoming a matter of of economics, a matter of politics. These organizations, these scientists and heroes of ecology will remind us that nature is very much the topic of the day, that our interrelationship to all life, where we source our food, how we care for wildlife, and the creatures we choose to consume, that all these things are registered in the web of life, that there is no such thing as a free ride, a free meal. When we consume the cheapest meat we can find, the cheapest eggs we can find, the cheapest milk we can find, there is suffering. Life was not meant be, to be treated like a cog in a machine. And when we move life through a factory for our selfish good and gain, we all suffer. And now we know this. We know this. And this doesn't mean that we all have to have the same path. It doesn't mean that some cannot consume meat. It does not mean that we all have to be vegan. It means that we are all being invited to consider our actions, our choices, and all the ways that people over the last decades have found ways to save money at the expense of the earth and now the earth herself is exacting her toll. What we once saved by buying clothing on the backs of cheap labor, what we once saved by celebrating the independence of our nation, whatever nation, 
through the factory farming of the meat that we ate, we are now paying for, literally paying for, businesses closing, closing, jobs being lost. We are interconnected. We are interconnected even in the darkness of your room at night. Your fears, your hopes, your prayers, your love. The kindness you carry every day is felt throughout this universe. We are interconnected and the earth, the natural world, is the first expression of spirit as we are. And the extraordinary difference is that we human beings who have come to separate ourselves from the natural world, though we too are an expression and a part of it, we have choice. And isn't it remarkable that all those natural beings from the stones to the plants to the animals that have less choice, that when left alone, they find balance. And yet, when we feel that we can act alone without consequence for where we drill, for what we wear, for how we consume, for how much we drive, we think that we will find balance through pleasure, and comfort, and safety. And we are living through the times that teach us the truth. That there is no such thing as alone. That we are always united. And more, not just united with land and water, plant and creature, with each one watching and listening, but we are united with all life at all dimensions. We are united with our ancestors. We are united with those that guide us. Call them what you like. Angels, masters, spirits, spirit beings, vibrations, dark matter. The universe is filled, filled with life and energy that we cannot see with our eyes or feel with our hands. And yet, that is what dominates existence and our little lives, our little planet, so fragile, is intimately interconnected with it all. And when we come together like this, when we open our hearts and minds like this, we learn to live in harmony. We find joy. We find beauty. And even in the most difficult times, we feel called to be a part of that life force. And so another reading, this one by David Bau Brower, the founder of the Earth Island Institute. And he wrote, We seek a renewed stirring of love for the earth. We plead that what we are capable of doing is often what we ought not to do. We urge that all people now determine that an untrammeled wilderness shall remain here to testify that this generation had love for the next. We would celebrate a new renaissance. The old one found a way to exploit. The new one has discovered the earth's limits. Knowing those limits, we may learn anew what compassion and beauty are, and pause to listen to the earth's music. We may see that progress is neither the accelerating speed with which we multiply and subdue the earth, nor the growing number of things we possess and cling to. 
it is a way along, along which to search for truth, to find serenity and love and reverence for life, to be part of an enduring harmony, trying hard not to sing out of tune. And so with that, what I'd like to invite is that we take a moment um, for a story. It's funny, I, I, um, I have to admit, I kind of got caught up in the emotion of the day and I, I, I wanted to lead with this story, but then it occurred to me, you know, it would be okay to, 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 to share a story later. So what I want to do is I want to share a story that I think illustrates what I've been talking about. And of course, it's an old folk tale, and of course, it takes place long, long ago and far, far away. And when we come to the end of that story, you know, what I hope to do is just kind of summarize what we've been exploring and talking about, and then bring us to a close with a with a meditative prayer. Um, of course, grateful, grateful for each of you being here, just being online, just being online, just having this streaming right now, or for that matter, I suppose, whenever you watch it, is a way of giving hope to others, that they can see that they are not alone in looking for connection, that they are not alone in seeking wisdom, that they are not alone in believing that this is a spiritual journey that we are on. And then when we recognize that we are spirits in a human dimension, spirits having a human experience, that we awaken to our interconnection, that we become as family. We understand we are at one. And the more we embrace that transcendent reality, the more we engage everyday life. So, to our story, long time ago, far, far away, there was a mighty king, and that king was um, on his way to visit another kingdom, there to take in a, a sporting event. One kingdom represented at another, as often was the case, and the king traveled across the far countryside in a chariot with a guard and a charioteer, both sworn to care for the king. And it was a, a dry season. It was a season of struggle, to be true. But the king was comfortable, had all the king might need, wine and food and the protection of the chariot, the horses and the men there to look after him. As the king left the perimeters, the boundaries, the borders of his kingdom, he heard the charioteer calling up ahead, off the road, off the road. And then the chariot came to a stop. The king leaned out the window to see what was going on. And there was a, a, a bedraggled uh, looking man. And a little further up the road, uh, a wagon of sorts with, with so much wood in it. But the wagon was, was, was tilted to the side. It was clear. The axle had broken. And the man said, please, please, won't you help me get to my village? It's not much further from here. I'm a carpenter. I have tools. I can fix my wagon. But I just, I, I, need, I have a family. I need to get home, please. Could you, could you just give me a ride? I'll sit on the back with the luggage. And the king looked to the wagoneer, the charioteer, the guard, and they were hesitating, thinking, you know, what harm could it do? And of course, the king pounded on the side of the wagon and said, keep going. We can't be caught up in things like this. If you're such a good carpenter, you shouldn't have such problems. What kind of a king would I be if I stopped what I was doing for every poor soul that didn't think ahead, that didn't plan well? You must be joking if you think that your little problems 
can meddle in the affairs of a king. My friend, you reap what you sow. Onward, onward. Well, the charioteer and the guard were feeling a little ashamed of the whole thing, kind of shrugged at the carpenter, and on they went. And so on and on they they traveled until, what do you know, once again, the king inside the comfort of his chariot heard a calling out. Some voices and noise as the chariot was slowing down again. And this time the charioteer having some sort of a conversation. What's going on out there, he said. What's going on? And he leaned his head out. And there, there was a, a family, a family, covered in mud, covered in mud and looking like drowned rats. And they, a, a, a woman came to the fore and she said, Oh, please, dear sir, please, we are humble farmers and it's been a dry season. I took my children today far towards the edge of the mountain and she pointed across a dusty plain. We were, we were going to the, to the green forest near the creek to pick mushrooms and, and berries that we might bring home to be a part of our fields and to help find food for the day. We have food at home. We, we could thank you in some way, but, 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 but we, we, we fell into a mudslide, fell into the river, lost all that we had collected. We, we just barely made it, made it to this road. We are so hungry and so thirsty. Please, our village isn't much further ahead. Couldn't you just give us a ride or a morsel of food? Oh yeah, said the king, I've heard this one before. Please, more peasants showing their lack of education. How could you travel so unprepared? How could you expect to exploit my kindness? How could I be the king of such a great land and, and give a handout to every single poor sod who falls into a puddle? or runs into a stretch of bad luck. I don't know what your king is like, but surely that is not how we sustain a nation, my dear lady. Your children will have to learn endurance. You reap what you sow, and I'm sure you'll make it to your village just fine. And again, he, you know, clapped his hands, on they went. Until finally, finally, it happens a third time. A third time the chariot comes to a stop. A third time the king is thinking like, what is going on? I'm trying to get to my sporting event. This is absurd. Who's out there this time, he says. I don't know, says the charioteer. The guard says, be careful. I wouldn't stick my head out this time. But the king puts his head out and there is a young man. And he looks like he's just been in a fight. A cut down by his eye, covered in dirt, looking bruised and disheveled. And he says, please, please, he's limping. I was out herding, riding our family's only horse. And she was spooked by a rattlesnake and threw me off. And my mother is, is actually a doctor. She is a healer in our village. It is the next village. Please, it's going to take me all day and so much pain to get home. Won't you let me ride on the back of your chariot? Put me with the luggage. Take me to my mother, the healer. She can look after me. We can thank you. The king just laughed. Everybody wants a handout. Give me a break. What kind of a country is this? And you, you are obviously a crook. You have obviously been in a fight. You are, you've got to think I was born yesterday. I'm sorry, my boy. You reap what you sow and you will learn that a life of crime doesn't pay. Onward, he calls. Well, he goes on and sure enough, there's the village, 
And sure enough, it's lovely, and he passes through, and sure enough, he continues through the next village and onward to the beautiful big city of that next kingdom, where he enjoys his great sporting events and being entertained among the lords and ladies of the land. He enjoys the company of the other royalty. And then, after a day of festivities, he decides that it's time to head back. They encourage him to wait and sleep another night. And he says, no, 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 don't worry, you know. I have my charioteer. I have my guard. We can travel into the evening. I'd rather wake up in my own castle, if you don't mind. Don't worry. They don't mind working hard. Which, of course, they thought was a bit absurd. Well, on they go, and they leave the castle, and they pass the first village, and they pass the second village, and sure enough, it's beginning to grow dark. And just as they start to near the outskirts of civilization, and they're coming to the last village, what do you know? But a snake slithers across the road and it spooks the horses and they, 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 they jostle, they jerk, they whinny and pull back and the chariot falls into a rut near the road's edge and the axle breaks and the wagon wheel rolls off. The king is jostled inside. What is going on out there? I'm sorry, sir, calls the charioteur, but it seems we have driven into a ditch the horse was scared by a snake. The king looks out to see the snake passing along. Hmm. Somehow a familiar story. Well, says the king, I'm sure there's a carpenter in the village up ahead. Why don't you go? Well, says the charioteer, I would be afraid to leave the chariot and the horses. What about the, the criminals that we saw on the road? The guard says, I would go, but who's going to help me? I look like a commoner. Fine, fine, says the king. The guard will go with me and we will find help. Of course, you know where this is going. They find their way to the village and they ask around for the carpenter and people point the way and there... As the sunlight is getting low, they come upon a very humble home with all kinds of tools on the outside and wood for working wagon wheels and axles. The king knocks on the door, and what do you know? There's the carpenter that he encountered on the road. And he said to the man, uh, 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 Aren't you the carpenter from the road? I'm so grateful to see you. As a matter of fact, we, we need your help. Do you remember when your wagon wheel broke and you said you could fix it? Well, we have the very same problem, my good man. I will pay you handsomely. Well, the carpenter looked at the king and said, um, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not a carpenter. You must be thinking of my brother. We look very much alike. No, he's not home. I'm sorry, I can't help you. What, said the king? You must be kidding. Look at all these tools everywhere. Surely you learned from something from your brother. Sorry. Hard for me to even know who you really are or where you're from, says the brother of the carpenter, who's obviously the carpenter. I'm afraid it's getting late, and this is no time for me to be letting strangers in. Please, sir, whatever you're up to, be careful. You reap what you sow. And he closed the door. Well, the king was indignant. And so he stormed off back to the wagon. No solutions. No solutions by the chariot. The charioteur sitting there not knowing what to do. This is absurd. Maybe we will find lodging for the night. There's no more food. No more wine. Where should we go? Back to the village, he returns with the guard, and sure enough, people point the way to the local farmer. That's where you can find food and rest. They bake bread. They store grain. They'll have something for you. And of course, you know where this is going. 
the same thing unfolds. He pounds on the door and there he sees the same family, now all cleaned up, now looking rested and surprised. You said that you had food. You said you were farmers. Well, it's me. It's me. It's the king from the road. I'll pay you handsomely. If only you could provide us some food, maybe some lodging. And again, the family says, hmm, no, can't say it rings a bell. We look like other families here. You know, peasants, we're all alike. Sorry, brother, you would be best to return to your chariot or maybe begin walking home and you'll find someone to help you along the way. Whatever you're up to, be careful. You reap what you sow. And with that, they closed the door. Well, now the king was outraged, outraged, and stormed into the darkness of the village, calling out for help, 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 demanding service, demanding attention. And there in the dark, he suddenly felt an extraordinary stinging pain in his leg and he fell crippled to the ground. The, the guard called out, someone a lantern, please, my king's been hurt. And guess who comes out of the darkness with a lantern? The young man, the criminal. And he said, well, what seems to be the problem? It seems my king has been bitten by a poisonous snake. Oh yes, says the young man, we've had a problem with those snakes. In the dry season, they've come close to the village. We've all been vulnerable, even myself. And what does this king expect us to do? The king looks up. He grabs the young man and says, Please, didn't you tell me your mother was a doctor, a healer? Couldn't she, couldn't she help me? I mean, you look well. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for judging you. I, I, I'm sorry for being so vain. How could I have known? And the young man said, well, I understand you have regret, but things aren't always as they seem, are they? And maybe this is just a trick that you're playing on me. A costume, a king I've never seen from a land I've never heard of. Maybe it'd be better if I just go home. And with that, he left. He left. And the king was laying there, his leg growing numb. The pain traveling up his body, already into his hips and moving up his spine. And the charioteur panicked. I mean, the guard panicked, didn't know what to do. He couldn't be blamed for the death of his king. And he fled into the darkness where the king lay there dying in the darkness of what he'd brought upon himself until he heard a noise and there a light it was the boy and he'd come with his mother and some of the other villagers and they brought a stretcher and they put him on and they took him to her home and there was the farmer's family and they brought him fresh water to drink, prepared food for when he would be on the mend as the healer was already drawing out the poison with a poultice and preparing a broth, a tea, that would make him well again. You see, she said, in a village like this, we know that no one lives alone. No one lives by their own doing, that we all need each other. And when you return to your kingdom, we pray that you will remember this kindness and what you almost brought upon yourself. We are all in this together, my dear king, said the wise, loving healer. May you remember you reap what you sow. And so it's a, it's a beautiful story 
that brings us closer to the close of our time as we realize that no matter what dignity and pride we feel in our own lives, all of our choices come back to us. All of our choices come back to us. And we have the choice, we have the choice to make the outcomes of those choices, the legacy of those choices into lessons that we can learn from and grow from, open our hearts and minds from, or we can continue to push people away, to live from fear as the king did, to feel like our best moment is a moment to protect, and that what we have is for us only what he learned in the village. And this was true. This was actually true of, of traditional people and ancient societies pre-industrial civilization. The wealthiest were known as those who give away the most. The wealthiest were known as those who gave away the most. Generosity was uh, an asset, a virtue celebrated above all else. And of course, in a community vulnerable to nature, vulnerable to the elements, vulnerable to the seasons and, 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 and wildlife and, 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 and the strength and uncertainty of other nations, people needed each other and they needed the land and they knew it. And in this story, the people of this village knew it. And yes, there were those who asked for help and maybe they could have had a better situation or not fallen upon bad luck. But bad luck, as the story reminds us, falls upon us all. No one could have predicted the moment we are in together. Not quite like this, although obviously many of us have seen news stories about predictions of the need to be prepared for this. But that is really where our energy must be, not on the blame of who predicted or didn't, who ignored or didn't, but how do we take this fragile moment that we're in and learn from it? How do we ask ourselves, how can we be more generous? Is it a thank you note for your delivery person? Is it an extra tip for your, journey, uh, for your delivery person? Is it a special way to show gratitude to the people in your local grocery store? Social distancing doesn't mean coldness or cruelty or ignorance. It just means space. How are you learning from this moment to open your heart beyond the righteousness that the king, the king embodied in self-preservation and surrender into the simple truth of our interdependence. Each person he thought he would never see again, that he thought he would never be accountable to, in time became someone he was absolutely dependent upon. And how many times did you think that that woman at the grocery store stocking the shelves in your way while you were in a hurry and needed to get your crackers or cookies. Could you ever have imagined that she would be this important to you now? That she would actually be putting her life at risk for you now? Did you ever imagine that when you passed the emails about teachers having better salaries and better resources? Did you ever think twice when at the beginning of the school year, your school asked you to bring supplies because they couldn't afford them as we had to? Did you ever stop to think, maybe things could be different. Maybe there's something I can give, something I can do. And if nothing else, can I, can I, demonstrate the power of simple kindness, respect, and an honoring of the interconnection of life. This is the lesson before us, and this was always the lesson before us. It's not just because of a pandemic. 
it's because this is the internal condition of our existence. We are interdependent. And if our species, if the human animal, is to survive for generations more, then the new paradigm, the new worldview that we must embrace as a majority, there will always be those in fear, in greed, in self-protection. But if we, if we, those watching, those listening, and the people you share this with, if we choose a new way of seeing and being in which we don't take just because we can, in which kindness comes first, in which we see all life as family, then extraordinary things are possible, great innovations are possible, and great joy awaits us all. And so as we come to the end of our time together, and I should check to see if I have any special notes from Susan. I have a reading that I wanted to share with you, and, um, and then we'll close with a prayer. And this is an old uh, Eastern teacher, very much in the spirit of, of, of Taoism, of Zen, very much in the spirit of the traditions that recognize that in, in the effortless unfolding and evolution of nature, we can find all the wisdom and love that we need, that we seek. Zenki Shibayama wrote, Silently a flower blooms, and in silence it falls away. Yet here, now, at this moment, at this place, the world of the flower, the whole of the world, is blooming. This is the talk of the flower, the truth of the blossoming. The glory of eternal life is fully shining here. That's from a book called The Earth Speaks. It was written decades ago. I believe it was actually early 70s that it was published. It's a wonderful anthology. Um, a wonderful, wonderful anthology. Uh, looks like maybe it was early 80s. Anyway, it's called The Earth Speaks, and it's still a brilliant collection. With that, let's take a moment, be grateful each, for each other, and let's close in prayer, each in our own way. So, Drawing your breath in, feeling yourself settle, feeling grateful for our community, for everyone that gathered here, feeling grateful, for the giving, for those who have given of their presence, their time, people who have donated, donated money to support our building, our staff, our leader, gratitude for them, awareness of all those who may watch this and gratitude for them, blessings for their journey. And may we find our way into a deeper stillness as we pray together as one. Spirit that is life to the great mystery, the pure existence, dear God, the one that is all, In our hearts, we hold this prayer for healing, wholeness, and hope. For all beings in need, whether it be healthcare workers, teachers, people facing illness, their families, the spirits of those that have departed, or anyone in need anywhere, those in refugee camps, those living on the streets, those beings, creatures experiencing their homes and habitats vanishing. In this moment, we hold our hearts open and radiate 
blessings, prayers for healing, wholeness, hope. We give thanks for all the ways we are nourished by life itself. We give thanks for the generosity of all those who are supporting us now and all those who have always supported us. May we find the willingness to love, to learn, to let go, as together, together we awaken to the true intimacy of our interdependence and give thanks for a world as one. Amen. So thank you, everyone. Thank you again uh, for being here. Thank you for your, your love and your blessings. And make sure that if you enjoyed this or anything that we're posting, share it with other people, pass it on. Uh, if you have any special needs, you can always reach out to the Althea Center and let us know. Our contact information is on our website. You can respond to posts like this. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. And again, thank you for your generosity and for all the ways that we are lifting each other up together. Love and blessings. And we'll see you next Sunday for a spectacular Earth Day Online. Don't miss it. We love you and we'll see you soon.